So this event tonight has been convened by Coventry Art Space and hosted by Warwick Art Centre, so uh, thanks to them. Um, I'm very much informed by some um, conversations and some research which suggested there need to, need to be a further transparency around the ways of working with galleries and museums. Um, and this is a perfect opportunity during a year of, of culture to think about the way opportunities develop, the way people can engage with our galleries and museums, but also what are the, what are the other ways of working, whether it's starting your own biennial, whether it's starting your own arts collective, or whether you're managing a collection. Um, we thought this would be an interesting point to come together and have a conversation um, and broaden out um, where we go next, because I think... We're in a, an incredibly exciting moment with City of Culture, which is drawing to an end, but has it changed practices? What are the, what are the opportunities to work together moving forward? Um, and what are the challenges that artists and practitioners uh, face? Um, so that's what we're going to be covering um, tonight through uh, the conversation with the panel. I'm going to make some introductions, but first of all, we've, we've had apologies from Francis Nielsen, who's the Director for Creative and, Cult uh, Creative and Cultural Director. I've completely fumbled that from, um, from Culture Coventry um, and the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum. She's not well tonight, so um, she sends her apologies, but I think between us we should be able to cover some of that, that ground as well. So just by ways of introduction, I'm delighted to introduce the, the panel. So we've got Ryan Hughes, who's the Artistic Director of Coventry Biennial. I'm aware that most of you will know uh, some of the people here anyway, but we'll do the formal introductions in any case. So Artistic Director for Coventry Biennial of Contemporary Art, um, a practitioner um, himself, an artist. Perhaps once upon a time. Uh, once upon a time, <laughs> um, which we, sh we should go into a little bit more. Mm. Um, but a fellow Southerner as well, from just down the road in Southam, so we'll, maybe we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sarah Shalgoski, who's curator at, here at Warwick Art Centre at the Mead Gallery, uh, but also for the wider University of Warwick, managing the collection and the public art, uh, the sculpture on campus, um, commissioning artists whole range of activity to explore there. And Tyler Patel, an artist working with photography, looking at analog and digital. That's correct. Yes. Co-founder of uh, Colle Covert, Arts, Covert Ar Collective. Arts Collective. And also you're a cust custodian of your late father's archive, um, Master G, uh, whose work you can see on uh, display at Compton Verde at the moment until 22nd of May. Um, so I think a further interesting perspective in terms of, of managing a, a collection and how you bring that to um, to a gallery, how you, you uh, expose work to, to wider audiences. So that's an introduction to the panel. What I thought I'd do is hand over to, to colleagues to talk a little bit more about their journeys in terms of working with galleries. Um, and I spit, I'm ex incredibly excited to be here tonight because I'm a curator by trade. I'm currently associate head at the School of Art and Design at Coventry University. Um, and I mourn the fact that I'm no longer a curator working in, um, in a gallery, um, but I still curate. Um, and I was thinking um, as we were putting this event together, what are our own journeys in terms of engaging with galleries? How do we develop our own careers and pathways? And maybe that's an interesting kind of starting point for the conversation today. And certainly my own um, introduction into uh, working with galleries and museums was through invigilating. It was then supporting, le lending an extra pair of hands, um, installing exhibitions. Um, this is at uh, Leamington Spa Art Gallery and Museum at the Pump Rooms. Um, then being allowed to curate something which felt very surreal um, after only a, a couple of years working with the gallery, before then uh, opening the door to other opportunities, working with artists, documenting um, artists' work, photographing exhibitions. And I think those pathways into working with institutions open up other doors. And for me, that's certainly been the case in terms of uh, a curatorial practice, but then moving strategically into managing the Visual Arts Network for the region and currently working with an art school. So I was going to open up the conversation and start with Tyler, if that's okay, first, and just to give us a sense of your own kind of 
pathway into working with galleries? So, I'm, as I say, my name's Hal Patel, I'm a visual artist, and I work traditionally with uh, film and photography. So, and as well as being an artist, I'm a custodian to my father's photography archive, which is a collection of photographs from 1950s to 2000 and documenting studio photography as well as family photography as well. As well as being co-founder of a the Covert Art Collective, all this, I guess, the real work kind of started with my father's photography archive. So I've worked with international art galleries as well as UK galleries as well. And I personally have actually worked with uh, the Herbert Art Gallery through a call out. So my experience working with art galleries is one of personal practice where it's, it's a case of having the artwork ready for an exhibition space, but also looking at the contractual information that you do have, also finding out, looking at fees, and all these, I, suppose, I think the small areas that you, you need to focus on, such as insurance, making sure that the work gets back to you. So I've gone to Mumbai and firsthand seen how inter international um, organizations actually deal with artwork as well. So that's been um, a really brilliant experience for me because it's something that I can build on. Um, and part of my practice is actually networking as well, going to openings, going to workshops, going to um, talks and actually speaking to people because I think a lot of the arts is actually talking to people and um, and they can be just a wide range of people from artists to curators to people that are working in galleries. So. Thank you very much, Tyler. I think that's incredibly important, those building of relationships and perhaps the timescales that it takes to develop those relationships and opportunities. I'm going to hand over next to Sarah Shargoski, um, if you could give us a sense of your journey. Well, I was going to say that I think it's possibly irrelevant now in that I'm in my 60s. So at the end of the 70s, when I started out, there was this wonderful thing that you could be unemployed and you would not only get dole money, but the city council would pay your rent as well. So it meant I could work as in an unpaid capacity in museums and galleries, which I did, and get experience, um, courtesy, quite frankly, of um, the DSS. And I don't think that's possible anymore. So I picked up on something Tyler said, said because my career did start in that my mum was an artist and one day the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford which is our hometown phoned up and said are any of your kids old enough because we need help and I arrived and I was given I'd just finished my O levels and I was given a screwdriver and the show was um, paintings from Paris works on loan from the Musée de l'Art Moderne and the first crate I opened was a Picasso and I don't think they'd let a 16-year-old do that anymore <laughs> with a screwdriver. But it was... Better than a Stanley knife. Better than a Stanley knife. But it was about being around, that I'd been around the gallery. My mum had been around the gallery. So there was that sense of connections. If I think of the young people with whom I've worked, it's always been that. It's always trying to pick up experience somehow while you know, earning a living or keeping yourself alive or living off your parents. But, you know, that's it. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think those are important points, aren't they, in terms of the economic basis for developing opportunities. And I think it's similar to the art school model, that art schools used to be free, and therefore it opened up the opportunity mm -hmm. um, to those that perhaps couldn't um, afford it now, to some degree. Uh, over to Ryan next, please. So, I mean, prior to art, I was doing art. I just wasn't necessarily aware that I was. So I come from what's really like a community organising background, uh, illegal raves, skateboard competitions, which were really about bringing people together to be creative in a place. After being fired from many, many jobs, uh, I discovered actually the place I could continue to do those things that had real value and interest was the art world. Um, 
So then there's a little chunk of my story that's very similar to Craig's that he described there, a stint of work at Leamington Art Gallery and Museum, first invigilating, bit of installing, took a much longer time before they let me curate something. Your example was two years. I think for me it's 15. <laughs> <laughs> and the last biennial, we just had a show there. So. Um, and so, yeah, as an artist, alongside that invigilation work, um, I was making my own exhibitions moderately successfully. So I was shown space at ICA London, MK Gallery, uh, the New Media Day at Festival in the Philippines. And then I realized that actually the most successful moments of the practice was where I wasn't making the work where I was working with other people to, to share and platform their skills. Uh, and so I started to shift to a more sort of curatorial practice and then uh, started the Coventry Biennial in 2017. Some years later, we've just closed the third Coventry Biennial. Uh, and through that work, we're working with a huge range of cultural institutions, locally, nationally, internationally. And it's across a real breadth of organisation from uh, local authorities, universities, uh, commercial galleries, they're fun, um, municipal galleries, this whole sort of uh, wealth of cultural organisation. Uh, and that's sort of where we are, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm sure some of this is going to be drawn out even, even more. I mean, I, I think that kind of practice base um, and experience in terms of those working with galleries in terms of curatorial capacity, um, but also technical roles is something maybe to, to pick up a, a little bit more. I mean, we've been working together, some of us, in terms of technician training um, and thinking about some, where some of the gaps um, of, of skills and expertise are um, and learning from technicians in terms of the ways of uh, continuing a professional development um, attached to practice, and I think that's a that's a big thing to to note is those opportunities for employment, but they're they're also ways of actually coming into contact with with other artists. Is that something we can expand a bit on? Maybe Sarah, um, in terms of I know you've you've written a bit about the gig economy and in, in relation to technicians here. Yeah, I mean it's. Um how do, I mean, mine is about economic survival. How do, you, how do you actually find a mean to support your practice? Um, and ultimately, having worked at the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford um, over a period of time in various capacities, I went away and then I came back and we formed a collective, all we technicians who'd worked there. We were Oxford Exhibition Services and I was the company manager. And we, I just managed a group of around 40 artists who we trained to handle works and to install them and to drive vans across the country to pick up works and bring them around, and I scheduled them. And I think I would say installing works of art might seem like the grunt work, the labour, which is not going to take you anywhere, but I learned a lot about how to hang a show by being a technician, um, how it might be curated, how the spacing worked, how you built spaces for breath, how you could actually accelerate the pace of the viewer and then slow them down, and all the discussions which take place in the gallery space. I mean, I think it's the best bit of the job being a curator, those two weeks in the gallery space with the real works of art, figuring out what they mean, what you thought in your head would work, why it doesn't work, and why you need to change it so that it does work, and how you always, always think of the viewer and how the viewer will move around it and their sort of physical relationship to the work. And hanging works, and also, quite frankly, just standing there holding it while somebody screws it up, you just manage to get a, a real sense of the work itself and look at it for longer than probably any visitor looks at it in the show. Thank you. I mean, for me, it was always around th that's the opportunity to spend some time with a curator as well. Yeah. As, a, as a technician, you get to understand um, some of those processes and get the insights. So in terms of making your own 
kind of approaches to working with, with galleries. It's through that kind of connection, similar to the networking, where you, you get some time that you usually, usually wouldn't, seeing what, what the workings of an exhibition making process is. I'm, I'm going to add on that. So um, I think in 2015, up, up till probably 2017, I, was, I worked for the International Dance Exchange as a volunteer and then the Birmingham Hippodome um, Heritage Project as well. And I think this festival. So volunteering your time is actually really useful because one, you get to see um, how the space actually works. You get to see how the technicians work, but you also get to see behind, like, you know, if they're contacting the council, if they're um, the risk assessment and things like that. And those are really practical things that you, you need to think about, especially when you're making work and how it's going to be shown, who it's going to be seen by. And yeah, I think volunteering is a really useful way. Although I think sometimes you can vo volunteer up to a point where you think I should need to be getting paid now because you have become c kind of experienced in your area. And I think that's, that's a really big point of when do you start asking yourself, when, do, when should I get paid for the work that I create? I, I think that's, um, that's a question that, that arts organisations and institutions are, are asking increasingly as well, the, the economy behind it. I'm going to hand over to Ryan now maybe to expand a little bit on that, on that point in terms of you know, judging that, that shift and thinking about those more practical um, things around how to judge the approach, how to think about asking for, for money, how to, how, to be, <laughs> how to enter into that kind of dialogue. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, uh, I mean, if we take the Coventry Biennial as an example, we, we started with absolutely nothing. A colleague at another very well-known biennial told me that the amount of money we had for the first biennial would have meant it should have been impossible and to probably give up. So, of course, uh, delivering that first biennial in 2017 with a pittance meant nobody was financially... Uh, valued but of course what we did do was hopefully create some sort of uh, critical mass in the city in a moment that had real cultural value and which impacted a range of strategies and changed changed some heads in the city I guess mm -hmm. so in 2017 of course I wasn't I mean I, I couldn't pay my rent but but that was fine for a time <laughs> because actually things were happening. Um, but then, yeah, of course, as things grow, there does become that point where actually if you're the only person in the room not being paid, which was happening more and more often, it's like, okay, like something does need to shift here now. And actually that was the point where we started talking to some of those partners like City Council, Arts Council, sort of the big investors and said, actually there's a real need here for organisational and business development. We've not necessarily got the skills, so I think what was going on there was actually that knowing who to ask for, for what kind of help, um, which comes back to that networking point. Um, but yeah, the, I think if you, with a clear proposition for and an evidence base, this is what we've done, this is why it didn't work, this is why it could be amazing, Actually, people are really receptive to that and I think generally will go out of their way to help you if they can. Can I just come back? I, I also think it's really important that artists value their work and that you do ask to be paid. Um, and as I said, you know, I've had quite a long career, but I remember when exhibitions pay right, payment right came in, I think that was about 1980, um, that artists should be paid for having their work in an exhibition and certainly if the organisation has any sort of public funding, you can look at the artist's newsletter, um, a statement of fees for artists, and you can see where to put your fees in terms of your overheads and in terms of your experience. So that you know, there, is a, there is a network, there is a standard for which people should be able to apply and feel very confident about applying for that money. And certainly if you're in receipt of public money, as an organisation, you should not be expecting people to work for nothing. 
I think this is moving us quite um, swiftly forward in, in terms of the economics of, of working with, with galleries. I think I'm not, maybe you can come back to this, this point, Sarah, in terms of um, the relationship with funders like Arts Council England, but um, venues that receive regular funding from, from Arts Council, the national portfolio organisations, have a certain budget. It's often not enough to do what's necessary in terms of delivering an exhibitions programme, the engagement, employing, employing staff. And that's not to suggest, I think, that artists shouldn't be paid, but it, there is often a, a crunch of, of how do you make things happen without compromise or without reducing opportunities, which is challenging when institutions, galleries, want to provide further opportunities for artists. And certainly in my experience, there's been a collaborative approach with artists working with them to develop bids to the Arts Council to support the development of work that then comes into the gallery space. And I think that, you know, although the Arts Council might look at it and, you know, argue that you might be double funding, it is a way of resourcing the development of practice. So it comes back to understanding how to support the development of work. And Tyler, I'm just wondering, kind of from your, your own perspective as an, as an artist, we've got schemes like developing your creative practice. And they all encourage these, these schemes of funding. They all encourage those partnerships with galleries, museums, or, or others. Yes, so, um, so I've, I've become like a full-time full freelance artist now. So my first tax um, assessment was done this year. And it really made me open my eyes to like what avenues of funding and who I could work with. And in the West Midlands, you do have organisations such as um, Art Space in Coventry, um, Steam House in Birmingham, and um, other outside online organisations that you can go to. I mean, even with ACE funding, they do workshops online. And I think the workshops are really important because it's it's not... You know, you have an idea of what you want to do, but you need to know how to write um, for those those grant opportunities. And it, it doesn't have to be art speak, but just having, you know, knowing how to write a budget, knowing um, where the exhibition could be, this is where you then need to start contacting people because that's the kind of information that they want. Um, yeah, so in, in that aspect, working with with art galleries i think is it's it, again it's it's down to networking as well and having that information in hand and for me though it's still important to actually have an understanding of contracts as well i just feel as an artist you need to have a well, you've got what <laughs> you've got social media that you have to contend with you're literally marketing your own marketing yourself online um you're hashtagging people, you're, you're always trying to connect in some way, as well as meeting or knowing the right people, as well as working with other artists as well. And collectives, I think, importantly, is sometimes you'll find that working as a group, you've got access to more funding. So that's another aspect that people or artists can come together and actually find a group that have an area of interest that's the same. And that's probably where Comtry annual comes in um, as a group and an organization as well did you want to pick pick that up Ryan in terms of mm. those but but also maybe there's something here in terms of the practicalities around what level of support that galleries might offer in the actual physical writing of of bids or you know wh where are the expectations for artists what where, where are you meeting those uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, on the, the point around collective action, I mean, Coventry Barney has always defined itself as artist-led. Uh, everyone that, I think still, everyone that works on the Barney has a practice of some description, whether that's making or writing. Or got a lot of photographers at the minute, I seemed, seem to think. Um, so yeah, I think we, we, we come at running the organisation with this sort of shared understanding of what it means to to make work and what we might well need or want if we were doing it ourselves so that's what we try to offer yeah. um, 
it's an interesting model you described where we, you work with an artist on a, a separate funding bid. That's not something we've done up to this point. It is something, of course, we're looking at, but it just feels like extra work for artists where, of course, we've got a team behind us. We can lean into that fundraising earlier on and leave the artist to do the things that they're great at, making work, working with communities. Um, but, of course, that's a, it's a drain on, on our team and there's only so much money in the public realm for art in Coventry. So mm. th there's always that edge of competition uh, around that as well. Sarah, is there a, a sense of your approach to that in terms of the f fundraising around around a, uh, an exhibition you could take Rana Begum's show, for example? Yes, we knew we wanted to commission work and I knew I didn't have a budget to do that. So we wrote various funding applications <coughs> and got money in largely from the Henry Moore Foundation to support commissioning the work. And in effect, the money came in from the Henry Moore and it went straight out to Rana to make the work. Yeah. I think there's something in that, though, isn't there, around actually knowing where to go for your type of practice. Of course, the Henry mm. Moore Foundation, named after a great sculptor, they're going to be interested in funding sculpture. Although I have had money from them for a painting. So they have, they, ha they do, I have to say, the Henry Moore Foundation does have a refreshingly wide view of what sculpture is. Was the paint laid on particularly thick? <laughs> <laughs> It was on the ground. <laughs> Sculptural. Um, can we talk about um, how artists put their foot in the door? How, what that first approach looks like in terms of, is it a networking moment, a conversation, a gallery opening? Is it through an employment opportunity, such as technicians? Is it a, a call for proposals? Um, and what's the sense of the journey after that moment? Um, the time frame, um, the developing of an idea, what comes next? Is it a studio visit, a gallery is actively looking for a particular type of work at a particular time? So that's quite broad, and I'm going to start with Sarah on that one, if that's okay. Gee, thanks, Craig. Um, Thomas is at the back, and I, we, we think about art all the time. And we think about our programme all the time. And our programme is funded by the Arts Council. And so we're just about to start writing what we hope to do over the next five years. And it won't be this artist, this artist, this artist. It will be an exhibition that aims to do this, an exhibition that addresses this audience, an ex exhibition that aims to show this sort of practice. And at the back of our minds, there are all these artists that we've thought of and whose work we really admire. And we think, how would that do? If we showed them, where would it take us? If we showed this artist, where would it take us? What would it do? What would it do to the audiences? And so it's all this juggling. And part, some of it is our ideas. Some of it is a art center or a local or a regional um, imperative. And sometimes we have an imperative and we haven't got any artists. And then we have to search for them and look for them and see how it can act. So it's, um, it's just an, it's a perpetual state of anxiety and interest, <laughs> looking for <laughs> artists, really, and, and just keeping in touch, and just keeping in touch. And um, I've mentored some artists um, in this room, and one thing I've said is, don't be afraid to send me information. In the olden days, I used to read the art magazines. And now, because we're not selling them, as the one venue in town that used to sell them, um, I don't read them anymore. But I get about 400 emails a day, largely from galleries and from artists. And I just do a quick, a click delete, click delete. But if it's interesting, I'll just slide it into a box. If I haven't made my mind up, I'll just slide it into a box. Sometimes um, you forward them to me as well, which I do really appreciate. Yeah, and sometimes I forward <laughs> it so if I think, because also we're a network. So if I know somebody else is working on a show, then I will forward it to them. And equally, I say to people, this is what I'm working on. If you see any, forward it to me. So there's all these emails pinging about. And as I say, some of them are just deleted very quickly because it's not what I'm looking for at the moment. And some I'll keep just in case. 400, that is, that's an incredible amount. 
Yeah, and the, I'm not counting the that's art. Yeah. I'm not counting the ones from the university about my risk assessments. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, we're filming this. <laughs> I, th I think there's something there about how you break through that level of information as an artist. And I've always encouraged the use, increasingly the use of the post <laughs> or the use of dropping something off because it's a very different medium coming into contact with something physical. And actually, it seems to me that it's, that, it's a challenge. It's quite a competitive area now to be able to... Get your That's attention. It's really interesting. Do you know, I don't get any in the post now. There you go. This is... <laughs> <laughs> what would... <laughs> and, uh, but would Although, you actually, up? no. I, I, I got... Um, the director of Kettle's Yard sent me a book the other day saying, this artist is really interesting. I thought you, could be, you might be interested in this. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I don't, I, Ryan, how does it work for you in terms of... It, we're talking about looking for artists mm. as galleries, but actually, what's the knock on the door look like? Th th there's a lot of knocks on the door. Some of them are more appealing than others, and I think a lot of the time that comes down to to how the knock is shaped, I guess. So there's a lot of emails that come in, can I have a show, this is my work. In a lot of cases, not all cases, but in a lot of cases, I'm, I'm not so interested. Like, there's a lot of great work out there. Most of it isn't going to land in my inbox, fully formed, perfect in context, shape, size, whatever. What I think is much more interesting is when the knock on the door comes, actually, these are the ideas I'm thinking about. It's a bit speculative. Can I talk to you about them over a cup of tea? And it's actually those people that six years down the line I might commission once we've had however many conversations about really great ideas. Maybe we've been to look at other art together. Uh, and actually, I think it's about building those relationships. It's a, a sort of networking, but I think it's much more about uh, like a shared sense of understanding of what's in the work. And I think that goes both ways. Of course, curators have things they're interested in as much as artists do. So I think actually if you can, if an artist can find a curator where the ideas really resonate off each other and in a particular place in a particular time, that's where great shows are going to emerge. But I, I don't think that can be rushed. <laughs> and, it, and just to pick up on that a little bit more, does that happen in isolation with a curator? What's the collaboration that happens within organisations? What are the decision-making processes? Um, is perhaps another, another question to ask. Um, and and how what kind of what do you need to go through in terms of making arguments? Is it is it, is it relates to the governance of the organisation? It relates to that kind of decision making mechanism. Is that something you want to take, Ryan, in the first instance, thinking about mm. the biennial which you've established a platform that you've made and where it's going? So it's a, it's a platform that I've established and that I've made, but as a social, political, and critical platform. It's one that I've always known has to be collaborative. So from the, the second biennial and the third biennial that we've just delivered, there was a, we call it a curatorial forum. So it's a group of curators sharing ideas, sharing links in the same way Sarah's explained. We're, we're looking at artists together. We're visiting shows. And we might back and forth ideas around, like, this artist would do this at the cathedral and it'll be amazing and then somebody might feel otherwise and we get into a bit of an argument and then uh six months later we cycle back to that artist and go oh no they would be right you were right the first time round." um which happens far more often than uh, yeah but yeah I, I think there's that same certainly for for the biennial there's that same level of uh, sort of theoretical and, and practical discussion between the curators and our partner venues, indeed, um, as there is with the artists. So in a way, as we get closer to the biennial, that becomes a three-way conversation. Artist, biennial team, partner venue. Mm. Maybe it's a four-way with a funder. Uh, and eventually, through, through those dialogues, you, you end up with... Uh, with a project. 
Great, okay, thank you for that. I'm moving back towards Tala, but I wondered, Sarah, in terms of um, the University of Warwick and, and the, the Mead and the collections, what your approach to, to that in terms of who you work with to make to make exhibitions? Is the curator the, the decision maker full stop? Um, no, I'm in, a, I'm in a much broader, more complicated team. So I work with Thomas as a curator and Liz, who's the curator of the collection. I am in the program team of Warwick Arts Centre. We report into the senior leadership team of Warwick Arts Centre. Warwick Arts Centre sits within the campus and commercial services of the university. And so there are, you know, quite strong business imperatives for everything we do. Um, and we're a national portfolio organisation. So there's the, there's the Arts Council delivery of, they currently have four pillars, which we need to deliver in terms of the art ecosystem of the UK. And then for the collection, I sit under um, an art collection committee, which ports into the University Council and is chaired by a senior academic. So there are so many things and deliverables I have to work out in terms of what the arts might do. Useful to know that, isn't it, in terms of those structures around, and some of that is very public domain in terms of Arts Council's Let's Create strategy yeah. and the investment principles. So being familiar with that, I think, is really important as a, as a practitioner. But also that context of what are the, what are a university's strategic goals and how they like that. Yeah, I think we all want to know yeah. if an artist can help us deliver against our KPIs, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if the knock on the door can include that, it's instrumental, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I think we're talking earlier. We we felt it was really important to say, it's not you, it's us. In terms of the, your work, might be fantastic, and the reason we're not going to show it is because we're having to do things with art that does do things and this work doesn't fit in that context but that doesn't mean it's not brilliant and wouldn't work somewhere else great thank you um i was going to hand back over to mm -hmm. to tala i was interested 400 emails six years in terms of developing relationships with with artists there's a question here from um, the audience submitted in advance. It sounds very kind of posh, doesn't it? Here's a question that we've had submitted, um, which is how can a Coventry-based artist break out of being seen as a local artist to be considered for the same opportunities as those based outside of the city? There appears to be a big divide between the smaller artists, uh, sorry, the smaller low budget group shows that feature local artists and large London or elsewhere artist solo shows, for example. Any advice for traversing that gap? So there's, there's a lot in, yeah. in that, but it's how do you, how do you make that, that kind of jump from local artist? To be yeah, I think I would probably put myself actually in that position. Um, so at the moment, I've worked on some international projects and they're through um, actual call-outs. So they're call-outs from universities where people have actually just sent me links. So I've been really lucky, but they're like sociology departments um, or international universities. So it's, it's really interesting where you kind of like try and get your name out, but internationally, I think is a really interesting way of building up your portfolio. Um, curator space, access... Access Web, um, Artist Network, all places where they do call-outs as well. And call-outs from galleries. But I'm also, I'm very strong in the opinion that if you can't find a space in a gallery or an institution that is known for art, it's actually just make your own space, um, take over a space, occupy a space, be as radical as you want to. Um, because, say, you know, everyone's got their own agenda of what they can show and what they can't show. And I think it's up to you as artists to actually change the shape and, you know, go where you want to go with your artwork. And if you, if it's for people to see it, then I think you, you do whatever you need to do to get that work seen. And that is whether it's fly po posting, whether it's billboards, whether it's anything and gets your attention gets you known. We've known artists that have done it. Thocker Wolf in Birmingham, he's been around. He's gone to, seen him up in London and all sorts. So I, I honestly, I don't think you should wait for galleries to show your work. Just go for it. Just um, 
start getting yourself known however you need to. Thank you very much. I think that's that's good advice and interesting to think about um, a city that's that's had to make a, bi a biennial it is around creating those, those opportunities. But I think the other thing you note there is going outside of the locality, that international perspective, going out to then come back in is a quite an important thing. I think that's that's resonated for me certainly in, in terms of practice, being able to bring artists back to the region after showing outside. Mm. You know, I think this idea of being a local artist I I is in many ways, a, it's a false idea. I mean, everyone lives somewhere, wh whether that's London or Coventry or Shetland or across the country, wherever you, like, just because you live in a place and make projects in that place doesn't necessarily mean you're like a local artist in some uh, like provincial way. I think, exactly as you were just saying, Craig, if you're, if you want to engage with the type of work that you make, go and find similar shows. Don't just walk through the gallery door and leave again. Perhaps ask to speak to somebody. And, uh, yeah, before you know it, you, you're not just making work in the place you live because you've met people in other places. And then quite quickly, they'll introduce you to somebody else in that place or in another place and opportunities abound, hopefully. Sarah, do you want to pick up a, on that well, from I yours? Well, I just want to say I started my career in um, Sheffield and we had a visit from the Arts Council who said, um, would you stop showing all these international artists? Please, could you show some local artists? And we made the point all of our international artists just happen to live in Sheffield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's how you... How you, part of it is how you position yourself. And I do try when we write about artists not to put in like Rana Beacon, London based, you know, she's Rana Beacon. Mm. You know, just because you think there are, there's, a, there's a place, sometimes it's important to know where an artist is from, but a lot of the time it's not. It's the work. Yeah, yeah. I'm just having a quick look at time and, and seeing we did have a, a another question. Um, pitched in from the audience but I think we've covered that to some degree which is around sources of influence that inspire the shaping of themes to programs we've spent a bit of time talking about that so I really just wanted to open it up now to audience we've got about 15 minutes to ask some questions um, so what's the burning questions you've got have we got any anyone that wants to kick us off there for any of the panel or we've also got Mindy from Coventry Arts Space who's will contribute as well. Here we go, fantastic. Hello, is it working? Um, I recently left uni maybe in October. I left to decide to be an artist full time. And up until that point, like I'd only just maybe drawn at home and things like that. So I just like, this was like the first time I've come somewhere to try like speak to other people, see what it's about, like what's, the very first thing you do, even as a local artist, I don't think I'm even considered that, to be honest. So, like, what's the very first thing you do? Like, speak to people who are in the same boat as you or, like, go to galleries or something? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm really I, 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 think this. I think you've literally just done it. <laughs> <laughs> you've come to an event in a room that's full of artists and you've asked a question. I think that that's literally the first step. Talking to Mindy should be your second step. Because Coventry Art Space do amazing professional development work and support artists. So. And then talking to everyone else in the room is your third step. <laughs> and then and then you've got to make something yourself in terms of a space. We were talking about about this prior to the the meet uh, to this event starting, just in terms of Birmingham scene and some of those spaces. It's that community, isn't it, of of interest? It's not just one conversation. It's the, it's the next. Yeah, I think it's um, also thinking about where you want a studio space as well. And again, it's all down to connections, like who visits that studio space? Um, how busy is it? You know, I say my, my first, um, because I probably started around 2015, but I was part time and working as well and trying to be an artist and trying to look after my dad's archive as well, which was so it was a lot to deal with, but um, I used to go a lot to um, First Fridays in, in Birmingham and have a look at the art scene there and, um, yeah, going to the open studios, which was great. And because you, it was, it's, 
that whole artist um, community and it's it's quite a, a, it's a, a really amazing buzz but when you also start I say another step is probably looking at the workshops available to you um, in, in the areas that you're interested in but um, it was it was an eye opener to find out that certain you know there are certain creators in like in the West Midlands or I say I spoke to um, a curator that in, that's in Liverpool that but they do go to certain studio spaces and that's something to think about um, you know with the development of your work as well. That's great. Thank you very much. And a uh, great question. Um, so we'll help you out with the introduction here. What's your name and where do you come from? <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Mel, or you can call me Medica if you can pronounce it, but it's not a stress to say that. Um, I'm from Coventry. I was born in Coventry, and um, I went out to London for uni, but I decided to leave quite early on. I, like, I, took, I, like, took, two, I took a gap year, even though I went to uni, and then I decided to come back anyway. So now I mostly work on sneakers and customizing sneakers, but I'm moving on to a more sculptural way where the sneakers aren't really wearable anymore. It's become like a display piece. And my goal is to hopefully have them in stores where they can use it as like a display piece for the new trainer that they've released or something. So that's like the kind of thing I'm trying to go for right now. Brilliant. We all know you and a bit more about you now, so that's great. Uh, any further questions? There must be some burning questions. or Min I know Mindy's got some backup questions as well. If well, we've got the questions we're always asked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is, why are you programmed so far ahead? Ryan's version is, hello, can my work be in the Coventry Biennial that opens next week? I've and been asked that one so many times. Yeah, and the reason we program around two years in advance is we need to have a lot of conversations with the artist so that the work develops and is installed and we have to raise a lot of money to put on the exhibition. So those two imperatives, and if we don't raise the money, then that affects the show. So we can't be at the moment of installing when we discover we haven't got the money. So it's a two-year process. It can be longer. It's very rare. It's shorter. And yet we do get people saying, I need a show next week. And that's so hard because it's just a completely different timescale to the timescale we work with. Mm. I think but as Tala said, if you find your own space, then you can work to your timescale. Yes, definitely. Also, I was just going to go back to the... Um the international question. So I'm, I'm working on a project with the British Council as well as um, Coventry City of Culture, and I'm working with an artist in the hall. So I think connecting to artists um, around the world. I mean, we've already done it through the pandemic with with Zoom and online conversations, but there's nothing stopping you from also opening up that relationship with other artists that are similar with what you're doing. So I think that's an important element. Sorry, that's just jumped onto the past conversation but I thought it's 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 um and also the British Council do advertise um funds available so that's another avenue to have a look at for artists great stuff okay do we have any other questions Sarah I'm looking to you that we'd did you have a question James Um, I suppose a question for all of you as um, both curators and practitioners, um, how, what are the trends, I suppose, that you've seen across the curatorial scene across your practice and such over the years? And as practitioners yourselves, does that have any influence on your practice and such? Or do you follow your own way, I suppose, in many ways? It, it's interesting, isn't it? This, this idea of sort of like the hot topic. And of course, there's what's sort of fashionable or in vogue in particular scenes, which if you can tap into, great. But I think the the other side of that, that same coin is actually Arts Council's investment principles, which are not just sort of government policies that are sort of picked meaninglessly. Like these investment principles around environmental change, ambition and quality, relevance, 
So actually, I think they're the, the big curatorial themes of our age, aren't they? Like, mm. Is the work relevant? Is it going to destroy the planet anymore? <laughs> I think relevance is a key one, but I would also argue that relevance has come out of Black Lives Matter, has come out of COVID, has come out of that sense that if everybody is going to go to all this effort, people have to come and see the shows and people have to be able to engage with them in a way that's meaningful. So I think in that's for me is a coming together. But I would also say that 2017 was the year of the textile in all the big exhibitions mm. and textiles are It was a really everywhere. comfy year. <laughs> <laughs> I remember being in Venice, <laughs> laying on a big soft ball, <laughs> glass of Prosecco in hand. Yeah, this trend is really good. <laughs> and in curating, just to say, it's not anything I admire, but there is also the Instagram moment. Mm. And I went to a really big exhibition. I thought, what is that really horrible large work doing there? <laughs> and it was because everybody took a photograph and posted it on Instagram. Well, that's nothing new. I mean, of course, the, <laughs> the opening work of Coventry Biennial this year was a work from the 60s, an art and language mirror mounted on canvas. It's the most photographed work in Tate's collection because Tate's audience is a narcissist. <laughs> and that's the, that's the world we live in. So I think if you're offering those opportunities... There you go. You've got full breadth of <laughs> integrity there. And <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Tyler, for you. For me, okay. Um, as an artist, you, you do see... You do so you go to exhibitions, you see what's around, but my areas of interest are memory, identity and space, and that works through any of the work that I produce. Working um, as a co-curator on my dad's exhibition, though, I know what I didn't want to see, um, which was just flat pieces of photography with just an information board. Um, so, you know, I, I can, I, you know, I've gone to past exhibitions and things like that, and I really wanted to come away from that. So, um, as a co-curator, as in my dad's ex dad's exhibition, I really wanted that personal element of stories and. Um, new media involved in in the exhibition, so I, I don't think I've really answered the question. But on, on my personal experience of how I work, it's not really with the trends. I don't think it's what I really you know what's in in my heart and what I want to be seen and what I want to share with the people that come to see the artwork. I I think thank you. I think for for me is always a conversation with a program which is you know, over a timeline, it's about what follows, you know, after a, an exhibition, it's about the legacy. Um, I think that's really important so that the works that we make continue to exist after that that particular moment, that trend, if you like. So I kind of feel like the exhibitions I was making at Midlands Arts Centre, for example, that seemed, seemed to land and they would resonate with things, things that happen in the world that make them resonate and live they contribute something to the exhibitions they don't happen in isolation but it really is about thinking where does this go this go next how does it continue to to live so for me that was that was it if you focus on that generally it will have some some resonance it becomes how the marketing team support frame it how they connect it how you let other people speak about it that seems to be very valuable Okay. Any further questions? How are we doing for time? We're nearly um, finished, I think. I, I'm just, I suppose, to, to pick up if nobody else. Has anybody got any other questions? Because I've got a couple that I wanted to ask. Um, I did um, want to ask Tala a little bit about her exhibition at, at, at Compton Verney, the Master G, when the conversations for that began. Um, so what was the kind of uh, uh, process in that? And the other question, so whichever order you, you think, the other question really was um, about, in terms of working with artists, um, this is more to the curators, with the artists you've worked with, what, what kind of makes, like, I'm really glad I worked with that artist. That, that was a you know, great project work with that artist. You know, so what, 
you know, what, what, what can an artist do to really work well with a gallery and to really make that a successful relationship? Um, so those are the sort of two questions, whichever order you like. Thank you, Mindy. Shall we start with Compton Verney? Yes, yeah, so the exhibition at Compton Verney is called Massage Through the Lens. The actual, it actually began last year, um, probably, I would say early spring, and the curators visited the photography studio, which is still running, to actually have a look at the photography archive. And it was more in the summer where contracts were drawn up, but it was, it was, um, great to actually have the art gallery actually come and actually visit the space and the area that the studio is based in because it gives you gives you an idea of you know who lives in this space and the people that you know come to the space and what the space actually means to like the family and to the community around so those conversations started to say from early last year and then we had a timetable of you know what we wanted to show in the um, art gallery, you know, the making sure that we had the right resolution to print, what we wanted to have for the information boards, what we then wanted for <coughs> marketing um, and the opening. So I think we actually worked till the wire. So it opened in February and we literally worked up till the beginning of February. And, um, but I'd say it's an, an exhibition of absolute joy and I really do hope you visit because yeah it's definitely one to, do, one to see I would say. Brilliant yeah encourage everyone to to visit I think also it doesn't matter if you've got two weeks <laughs> or two years does it everyone walk <laughs> to the wire that's that's an important uh, thing about working in our sector. Um, to the to our, our curators then in terms of artists that you've worked with you from summarizing your question right that you've worked with who you're really pleased to work with that have contributed something and what that legacy of that relationship might might be i mean for me of course i said i, I wanted those first conversations to be around ideas if after six years of conversation if together you can still come up with really exciting ideas that that feels successful i think it you, you might do a great one project together, but collaboratively you've got nothing else in you. Fine, that's a good project. But actually, if you can keep generating new ideas and that, that, that's the dream, I guess. Right. And for me, it's working in the envelope that I do. I have the artists and their work I have the space, which is quite an unusual space, and I have the audiences, both current, but also the new audiences that we want to attract. And it works for me if the artist is interested in all three so that we can have discussions about all three. And it doesn't really work for me if the artist will only talk about their work and won't talk about the space or the audiences because I have to pretend to be them to pick up, and I'm not them. I'm not the artist. Thank you. I was just going to contribute my own, which was, again, that legacy point. I think it's working with an artist that may have got one example of a of a five year conversation, maybe not quite <laughs> six years, um, that led to exhibition. But it's really around again those opportunities that have occurred occurred since so a, a project i'm very proud of is working with um barbara walker on her show shock and awe at midlands art center and seeing the impact of that body of work relating to further opportunities so since then the work with international curators forum at the, um, the diaspora pavilion in venice um the british school uh, in rome residency those things i wouldn't claim you know the the work that we did together is a result of that, but it's a contributor. And I think holding that in mind, that there's always about how do you prepare and encourage and leave the artist in a better position through the working relationship is, is key, really, what it leads to in terms of opportunities. That's very exciting. It always has, it has been, and that's where I need to go. In. Yeah. 
Okay, well, we're pretty much on time. It's bang on seven o'clock. I was going to see if any further hands went up, but I think you're probably looking forward to stretching legs. The panel probably are. So it just remains for me to thank very much Brian Hughes, Sarah Shelgoski, Tyler Patel for joining me on the panel today and to Artspace for, uh, and Mindy for convening. And many thanks to you for joining and being part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.